So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're doing another UK case. It's been quite a while. Actually, no, it hasn't. I'm completely lying. It's been one video since I did a UK case. I don't know why it feels so long, but today we're doing another UK case. This time from Warwickshire. I don't think I've ever done a Warwickshire case. Today we're going to be talking about Gemma Hater. And you might have heard of this case before online because it is quite a talked about case in UK true crime. And I just want to give you a warning in the start that this one is so deep. It is, it's really heartbreaking. It's a really touching case. Just a couple of content warnings before we get into this one. We will be talking about a hate crime against a disabled person. We're going to be talking about manipulation and taking advantage of vulnerable people. All that kind of topic and theme is constant throughout this video so if that is something that you don't want to hear about feel free to click out of this video right now i won't be offended just make sure you look after yourself and i'm sure i'll see you again some other time with a video that's maybe a bit more suitable for you but all that being said before we get into the case i just want to thank our sponsors for making this video possible raid shadow legends in raid shadow legends you get to take on dungeon runs raid bosses campaign battles with over 5,000 champions all with their own unique skills you get to build together your own team and raid your way and you can use the link down below in the description to download raid shadow legends on pc or on mobile i just want to talk to you guys quickly about my personal favorite dungeon boss this is the fire knight he is one of the most challenging dungeon bosses that there is he was once a knight protecting the kingdom of volcar but one day he flew into a fit of rage and killed the frost king and ever since then he was bound to the fortress and he he was forced to guard it to this day. But how do you defeat the Fire Knight? Because his shield actually makes him really hard to defeat. You need to pick a team of champions that can deliver multiple moves per attack in order to get this shield out of the way so then you can start dealing damage to him. My personal favourite champion is this guy. It always has been. I think he's so cool. My favourite skill of his is Hellraiser because it deals damage to every single enemy. And this month, Raid Shadow Legends have non-stop summer surprises and events for you guys to get involved in. There's special fusion events to get hold of a brand new legendary champion. There's tournaments against other players. They've also released five new champions that I'm really, really excited to use. There's never been a better time to get started on Raid Shadow Legends. There's so much new stuff going on right now that you need to get on there. So if you want to get a head start, you can download it using the link down below in the description of this video. Or you can scan the QR code that's on screen right now. And if you do, you'll get an epic hero named Chonaru. You'll get 200k silver, one XP boost, one energy refill, and one ancient shard. All those rewards will be waiting for you right here in game. They're only available to new players for the next 30 days, so make sure you're taking advantage of that right now. The link is down below in the description to download it, or you can scan the QR code on screen. Thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Now, before I get into it, I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes, and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet, and I'm compiling into one video. Gemma Hater was a 27 year old woman born on September 13th 1982 in Rugby Warwickshire which is in England. She was the youngest of three siblings. She had an older sister named Nikki and an older brother named Neil and Gemma's mother Sue was absolutely over the moon about having a third child. She'd already done this twice now. She was like a pro at it <laughs> pretty much. She thought she knew exactly what to expect but when she actually had Gemma she noticed a lot of differences in her compared to her other two children. Gemma was developing slightly different to her two older siblings and her mother noticed a lot of things like Gemma was very clingy, very needy. She always wanted cuddles, which is so cute. But she was also quite messy and clumsy and destructive and chaotic. And she would like take all of the food out of the cupboards in the kitchen and just throw it all over the floor. But she wasn't a naughty child. It was like she was doing all of this in an innocent way. She didn't quite realise that she was causing such chaos. She was quite oblivious to, to her actual behaviour. And her mother Sue said that it was that. It was her obliviousness to all this chaos that she was causing that made Sue think that maybe her daughter Gemma 
needed to go to the doctors. Maybe she needed some kind of diagnosis. She actually suspected at the time that maybe Gemma was on the autistic spectrum. So they took her to the doctors and this diagnosis was gonna prove very hard to get. She saw multiple doctors. She had pretty much every test under the sun. She had chromosome tests, absolutely everything, but they couldn't for some reason get a diagnosis for Gemma. Every single doctor that saw her all agreed and acknowledged that she did have something, but that something was hard for them all to agree on. So she would go and see one doctor who would diagnose her with autism and then she would go and see another doctor who would say, no, her previous diagnosis is wrong. She doesn't have autism, she has this. And then she would end up seeing another professional and that person would say she doesn't have autism or this other thing. She's actually got a third thing. And so for that reason, every single healthcare professional that Gemma pretty much ever saw said that she had something but they couldn't diagnose it. And because she never had a permanent diagnosis, that meant that she also didn't really get access to the care that she needed. She wasn't offered access to certain services because she didn't have the diagnosis required to use those services. I mean, she was given access to some things because doctors did acknowledge the fact that there was something there, but she couldn't have the proper specialised services, you know, specifically for people with what she had because they didn't know what she had. It's hard because every single one of these different things that she was diagnosed with or tested for all required such different targeted care and assistance. It's just like physical disabilities. They would all require different assistance in a, in a different way, you know? And it's the same with mental disabilities. She was passed from agency to agency to agency. She was seen by almost 200 separate doctors in her lifetime. And yet she still never got any proper care. It was just so, so frustrating, not only for her, but for her whole family as well. They all wanted to help her. Her mother, Sue, said that she was humiliated every time she would go back to the doctors or to a specialist and say, look, my daughter needs seeing again. You need to assess her again because there is something that you're not seeing. And these specialists would literally turn around to Sue and call her an attention seeker. They would say there is nothing wrong with your daughter that we can officially diagnose, stop asking for it. They fought and fought and fought for Gemma to get a proper diagnosis and proper care, but it never came and her family really, really tried for her. They really did. And they were always worried about her growing up without this diagnosis or anything like that because the world was harder for Gemma to navigate than it is for the other kids. School was harder for her than her peers. And they were worried for her that she was gonna have to learn to live and operate in a society just the way that everyone else does, but her brain doesn't function the way that everyone else does. So she was unfairly disadvantaged in life without this assistance and this care. There would always be things that she wouldn't understand or she wouldn't do properly. Maybe she'd get into trouble for certain things because she simply just did not know how to do them properly. Things like personal care, she never really managed to, you know, look after herself, shower regularly and brush her teeth, you know. These were such huge, difficult tasks for her to do every single day. Every single day was kind of out of the question for Gemma. Her mum had to like borderline force her to keep up with stuff like that, otherwise her personal care would just fall completely. Not because she was lazy, but because it was genuinely just more difficult for her to manage and maintain than it was for other people. And because Gemma never got any form of diagnosis, she had to just go to any old state school rather than a school for kids with special needs where she would actually thrive and excel. And it was very clear that she was struggling in this state school because she wasn't receiving the proper care. Her teachers would write home to her mother and say that she's coping. She's coping. What does coping mean? To me, coping just means she's getting by. She's not doing well. She's not achieving her full potential. She's coping. She's doing okay, she's coasting by. Finally, when she was 14 years old, Gemma Hater was offered a space at a school for kids with special needs. And this was great, although it did come just a little bit too late. I mean, she was 14 now. 
She'd already done most of her schooling in a state school where she didn't excel. It should have happened sooner, but at least it happened in the end and she went and joined this school and she started doing so well. She made so many friends that that just understood her, finally. She could fully relate to these kids in this school because they all shared these same challenges in life and here in this school, they were fully accepted and pushed even with these challenges. There was a lot less bullying, a lot less, you know, tormenting because Gemma received a lot of that at her state school. Here at this new school, she made a best friend called Kay and they used to spend so much time together. They were into all the same bands. They just used to have the best time together. They used to just go and listen to these CDs together and dance around their bedrooms. And you know, she was finally happy that she'd made a friend that fully understood her. And it was around this time as well when Gemma was still quite young. I think she was actually 11. So maybe I'm skipping back in the story a little bit that her older sister, Nikki, actually had her own child. So now Gemma was an auntie at the very young age of 11. And because this age gap was kind of smaller than, than the average auntie niece kind of age gap, they were more like siblings. It was like she had a little sister and she was absolutely besotted by her niece. She was amazed with this little child. She used to follow her around everywhere. She used to play games with her because Gemma did have quite a, a young mind. She was quite immature for her age. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't really know how to word that in a nicer way, but she liked playing all these games and with all these toys. Even when she was like 14, 15, she would play with kids' toys with her niece and they had the best time. She loved her. In every single picture of them together, like they're always glued at the hip. Like Gemma's always got her niece on her knee or they're playing. Like there's no pictures where they're like on the other side of the room to each other. They're always together. But it was also around this time that Gemma's physical appearance started to change as well. She actually stopped growing at four foot 11, which is pretty small. If you're not used to the imperial system, that's about 125 centimeters. The average height for a fully grown woman in the UK is five foot 4.7. So almost 5'5", five, 5'4.7 five. Five is exactly my height if you've ever met me before. So 4'11 is like almost half a foot smaller than me. 4'11 is short for a fully grown woman. And Gemma also started to gain a lot of weight as well. And it was seemingly without a cause. It wasn't like she was overeating. It wasn't like they could identify why she was gaining weight. And so her mother decided to take her back to the doctors again. And when they went to the doctors about this, about these two big changes with Gemma's appearance, the doctor actually diagnosed Gemma as going through the menopause at like 12, 13 years old. If you don't fully know what the menopause is, it's when someone that has periods stops having periods and like they're no longer fertile, they stop making eggs to reproduce. It normally happens when a woman is in her late 40s, maybe 50s. So this was very strange for Gemma to be going through this. I don't know if they ever actually fully figured out why she was going through the menopause at 13 years old. 13 years old is when someone should start having periods, not stop forever. But this was just another thing that set Gemma apart from the other kids. And like I said, she did struggle with bullying. Her older brother remembers that every time they went to the park, Gemma would get picked on, she would get stared at, kids would shout things and call her names. And she never really understood it. And also just because of who Gemma was, she was just this big bundle of positivity and love and joy and she just cared for everyone. She saw the good in everyone. So even if she was picked on, she got upset by it but also at the same time she was so forgiving. I think it was a mixture of her just being a really nice person but also her just sadly being used to it because she would get it so often that it no longer really affected her. But she was a very very naive person. She could never fully tell people's intentions. She couldn't tell a good person from a bad person. She was kind to everyone. She was nice to everyone. She never held grudges. You know, someone could say the most awful thing to her and she would forgive them and be friends with them a day later, which is, you know, it's a nice thing, but it's also a curse. That meant that Gemma kept a lot of bad people around her because she was so forgiving. She was such an amazing person, but 
she she shouldn't have been because then it meant that she had a lot of bad eggs in her circle. Anyway, when she was 19 years old, Gemma finally got the chance to spread her wings and move away from her family home when she was offered a place at a residential college in Wales. And understandably, her mother was very, very anxious for her. This was her first time ever being fully, fully independent and in a whole other country as well, which was scary. She was very reliant on her mother because her mother was the only person that fully understood her. Of course, because she was never diagnosed, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but this is such a big theme in this case. She wasn't diagnosed, so she wasn't getting any proper care or assistance. Her mother was the only person that could give her that. And now she was moving away from her mother. This was a huge, huge moment. And the college reassured Sue as much as they possibly could that she was in good hands. This residential college was specifically for people with special needs. So she was fine. She was going to be cared for. She was going to be with people that understood her and could relate to her. This wasn't as scary as it could have been. So Gemma moved there to this new college in Wales and she absolutely thrived there. She made so many new friends, developed all her social skills. She developed so many skills. She learned how to properly cook for herself. She was maintaining a good like clean apartment, which if you remember, she wasn't very good at keeping herself or her space clean but now she was. She was really doing so well. She was there for two years and at the end of that two-year course, Gemma was actually offered a space to stay for one more year and like develop this course, but she didn't want to take it. She wanted to go back home to her family. She she kind of had enough of college. So she decided that she was going to go back to Warwickshire, but she wasn't going to move back into her family home. She wanted to maintain this new independence that she had from moving out. So she went back to Warwickshire, but she got her own flat. She started renting a flat. I believe that the flat that she actually got was some form of supported housing from the government because they did acknowledge that, like I keep saying, that they did acknowledge that there was something, you know, there, but without a diagnosis, they didn't really know what it was. But they knew that she needed help, you know, financially because she couldn't get a job as easy as other people could. So she was in this supported housing, but because it was supported housing, that meant that there were a lot of unsavory characters in her building because imagine the kind of people that also need supported housing. That's violent prisoners that have just been released after their sentence and now they're trying to reintegrate back into society. There were a lot of those in Gemma's building. There were drug dealers in Gemma's building, literal crack dens in her building. There were always police round at some flat in that building. It was literally described in one of the sources that I read as one of the roughest buildings in rugby. And this is a very vulnerable, naive woman that they have put in this building. I mean, it was nice that she was given this supported housing, that she was given money towards her rent and stuff like that because she needed it. But this was also quite a dangerous situation to be putting such a vulnerable person in. It was a disaster waiting to happen, I think. But, you know, at least Gemma got a house out of it. But she did need way more than just a house. She actually wrote a desperate letter to her local government begging for help in employment and with benefits. And her general welfare, she desperately wanted assisted living because like I say, she wasn't very good with her personal hygiene and keeping her space clean and cooking healthy balanced meals for herself three times a day, every day. This was too much for Gemma. She wanted assisted caring living. She said in this letter to the government, I would like a job. I need my independence. I would like someone to help me when I ask for it. This is what I need and want in my life. So someone was sent out to assess Gemma and see if she needed assisted living. However, the results of this assessment rather disappointingly came back that she was capable of living alone. Apparently the guy that actually came to assess her was only there in the house for about 10, 15 minutes. And for most of it, he wasn't even talking to Gemma. Gemma was outside having a cigarette. So what was this guy even assessing? So she wasn't given any assisted living, even though her family believed that she so needed it. But you know, for the time being, she was living alone. And she was doing well for a while in her new flat. She was looking after herself and her space and her family was so proud of her. But then soon it started going downhill again. She stopped tidying her flat. She stopped cleaning up. She stopped cooking herself proper meals. She started just eating snacks or takeaways all day. She stopped 
with her personal hygiene as well. There were just piles of rubbish and dirty clothes and, you know, filthy plates and forks and food wrappers all over the floor. Literally every inch of her floor, you'll see pictures, there was nowhere to even walk because there was just rubbish everywhere. And she actually stopped letting her family into her flat because of this mess, because she was so embarrassed by this mess. Her family actually had no idea that this was what the inside of her flat looked like. They also didn't know that Gemma, at this point in time, was getting threats from her landlord that she was gonna be evicted if she didn't sort out the apartment because neighbors were complaining of a smell coming from her apartment. So no one had any idea that Gemma Hater was living in absolute filth and squalor with the potential of being homeless at any minute if she didn't sort it out and she wasn't sorting it out. I think there was also an element of Gemma not wanting her family to worry about her either. She'd only just gained this new independence and she was loving it. And she thought that if her family saw this flat, then maybe they'd get in contact with someone because they, didn't think she should live alone. Maybe she feared that they would no longer let her keep this flat if they knew what it was like inside. So she just hid it from them. She hid so much from her family. But one thing she didn't hide from her family was her new friend group. She'd recently made friends with this girl and she was so happy. She was over the moon because Gemma had really struggled with socialization and making and keeping friends all her life. And so her family was so proud of her. They wanted to hear all about this new friend and all about their stuff that they used to get up to. It all started with a girl called Chantelle Booth. Um, she was Gemma's first proper friend, first close friend. I don't know how the two of them met, but Chantelle was quite a bit younger than Gemma Hater was. Gemma was 27 at this point during the case and Chantelle was 21. So she was about six years younger. But her family said they actually thought that would be better for Gemma because like I said, she was quite young in her mindset. So she probably actually had a lot in common with Chantelle. The two of them would often meet up regularly and go for drinks in pubs. They would go watch films. They would just chill together in their apartments, whatever. And eventually Chantelle introduced Gemma to the rest of her friend group until there was about six of them. This friendship group, there was about six of them and Gemma was happy. She used to do stuff with them every week, multiple times a week. They'd go out on the evenings. She finally had a social life. She finally had her tribe, you know? She felt like she belonged. Everything was just going so well for Gemma Hater. But then in the summer of 2010, all of that changed. On August 9th, 2010, rugby police received a phone call from a man who had been out jogging that morning around 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m. up on one of the disused railways. I think it's quite a common thing in England to take a railway path that is no longer obviously a railway and turn it into like a nature walk or a little trail. So they're quite popular with joggers. This guy was jogging on there at 5 a.m. and he noticed something in the grass. He didn't get too close to it, but he saw what looked to be bare legs in the grass and he just panicked. He didn't want to go over there and investigate further. And so he called the police fearing that maybe it was a dead body. So police rushed straight down to the scene on this disused railway and there they confirmed that this was the body of a young woman. She was actually found naked laying face down in the grass and she was very clearly murdered. This was not a natural death at all. She had a bag over her head, there were marks around her neck, she had bruises, grazes, cuts, scrapes, all over her body. She looked like she'd been beaten savagely. And when they removed that bag from her head, this only revealed even more injuries. Her nose was broken so badly that it was almost severed from her face. Her bones had come disconnected from her skull. Her whole face was just black from where she'd been beaten so savagely. She had a very distinct footprint on the side of her face where someone had literally stomped on her face. And there was also a stab wound kind of at the bottom of her neck, at the top of her back. This woman looked to have been not only murdered, but tortured before she was murdered. Her body was transported to a morgue where they hoped that they could identify her and maybe carry out some form of autopsy just in case there were more injuries that they just weren't aware of. At this identification, they confirmed that this was the body 
of 27-year-old Gemma Hater. Her official cause of death was actually from asphyxiation. Like I said, her nose was broken so severely that she'd actually choked on her own blood. That blood had blocked her nasal passages and she'd suffocated on her own blood, drowned in it. So police now had the very challenging task of informing Gemma's family that her body had been found. And as I'm sure you can imagine, they were absolutely distraught and so shocked this had come out of nowhere, absolutely nowhere. Gemma's sister, Nikki, says that she was particularly torn up to hear that her sister had been murdered so suddenly because they were actually on quite bad terms at the time. Not severe bad terms, but the last time that Nikki had seen Gemma, they'd actually ended it with an argument and they never made up before Gemma passed away. A few days before her body was found, Gemma had been out for the day and she'd missed her last train home and she got stranded somewhere. And so her sister Nikki had to leave the house in the middle of the night to go and pick her up. And on the drive back to Gemma's house, Nikki was having a go at her saying, this is out of order. Like you should be more on the ball with this kind of stuff. You can't be asking me to come out of the house in the middle of the night to come and get you. She was just saying that she was disappointed in her. How could Gemma have done this? And that was the last conversation that they had, Gemma hearing that her sister was disappointed in her. This was one of those arguments that would have literally been resolved the next time they saw each other, but they weren't gonna get that next time now. It's so heartbreaking. I'm sure that Nikki wishes with everything in her that she hadn't had to go at her sister that night, that she'd have gone a bit easier on her, or maybe that they'd ended things on good terms before Gemma got out of the car on the other side. But anyway, it was Gemma's mother, Sue, and her older sister, Nikki, that had to go into the morgue and identify her body, like a formal family identification. Her older brother, Neil, was also asked to go and do it with the other, ma uh, the other family members, but he said that he couldn't do it. He could not see his baby sister in that way. Her head had actually been shaved by the pathologists in order to do this autopsy. They had to get rid of her hair to be able to see any injuries that were underneath on her head. And her sister, Nikki, just said it was so awful to see Gemma in that way. Like, all of her dignity stripped, her hair shaven, all the injuries very apparent all over her head. Her face was black. From all the bruising and all the blood swelling and pooling in her eyes, like, she was so swollen in places, she barely looked human anymore. She was that beaten. Even Gemma's 87-year-old grandmother went in the morgue to go and identify and say goodbye to her. And I just think that's especially heartbreaking. No grandmother, no 87 year old woman, well, no mother, no sister for that matter, should ever have to see their loved one in that state. But for such a, I don't know, just to hear that an 87 year old woman went in and saw her grandchild like that. It's honestly horrific. Of course, the family tried to help the police in this investigation in any and every way that they possibly could. Because yes, Gemma's death was very sudden, very unexpected. It seemed to come out of nowhere. But at the same time, now that her family had had a little moment to think about this a little bit further, they were suspicious of one group of people in particular. And that was Gemma's new friend group. Chantelle Booth, Chantelle's boyfriend, all the other people that Gemma used to hang out with because in the last few months, as she'd become friends with them, her family had noticed a lot of things changing about Gemma. And while Chantelle seemed like a great friend to Gemma at first, her family had watched a few red flags arise during this friendship. So there were five people in this friend group, six if you include Gemma, but five without. So there were two girls and three boys. Of course, there was 21 year old Chantelle Booth, who was Gemma's closest friend. And then there was her boyfriend, 19 year old Daniel Newstead. The other girl in the group was 18 year old Jessica Linus. And then there was her boyfriend, 17 year old Joe Boyer. And the final person in the group, the other boy was 19 year old Duncan Edwards. 
woods. Most of these other friends actually lived on the same street as each other. So Chantelle and her boyfriend, Daniel, lived in one particular apartment block and on that same street, there was Jessica and her boyfriend, Joe. Duncan Edwards still lived at home with his parents. I'm not sure where he lived, but the other four actually only lived about two miles away from where Gemma Hater lived. And Chantelle Booth, of course, Gemma was the closest to her in the whole group. She was the oldest one in the group, apart from Gemma. And she was kind of like the ringleader, the, you know, she called the shots in the friend group. She was that one friend, I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but the group won't hang out unless that one particular person is there because she was the one that connected them all. The friend group just wouldn't hang out if Chantel wasn't there. So naturally she had a lot of power in this friend group as well, a lot of dominance. And so police really wanted to hear more about her and look into her a little bit more, but they didn't want her to think that she was a suspect just yet. Just in case something was going on here, they didn't want to make it too obvious that they were looking into her. And so instead of just calling her straight into the police station, interviewing her as a suspect, they decided to try and go another route. They needed proof that Gemma and Chantal and potentially the rest of the group were together on the night that Gemma was murdered. And so in order to get that proof, they tried to look for CCTV evidence. They managed to find out where Chantal lived and they went down to her apartment block and got some security footage from the CCTV cameras outside of her building. And sure enough, that whole group were together on the night of Gemma's murder with Gemma. All five of them had been in Chantel's apartment on the night of the murder and they all left there just after midnight. The whole group start walking down the road in the direction of Gemma's house and Gemma is lagging behind the group. She's carrying this white carrier bag. And because it looked like they'd set off in the direction of Gemma's house, detectives tried to follow the group on a bunch of different CCTV cameras on that route. They were able to follow them for a few streets until eventually they lost them. They walked out of the view of any security cameras and then they couldn't pick them up again until about an hour and a half later when the group set off again back up that road in the opposite direction. So they're walking back in the way that they came and now there is no Gemma. Gemma's gone. So immediately police were very concerned about this. The whole group set off on the night of the murder and the rest of them returned home without Gemma. This looked so suspicious. So they went back to Gemma's family to ask a little bit more about this friend group. Who were they looking into here? What were these red flags that Gemma's family mentioned to the police? Well, it seemed that Chantal Booth, particularly the 21 year old, had always been quite controlling of Gemma. And yes, she was naturally a very dominant, very, powerful person in this friendship group, but it was verging on controlling. Actually, at this point, it was way beyond controlling, but in the run-up to it, it had been pushing the boundaries, pushing the boundaries, until now, at the point of Gemma's death, it was full on controlling. Chantel always called the shots. Whatever she wanted to do, they did it. If she asked someone in the group to buy everyone around at the pub, they would do it because they didn't want to say no to Chantel. She would ask Gemma to do anything, to go anywhere, to get her something, and Gemma would just do it. Gemma's family actually never fully understood Chantelle's friendship with their daughter. With all respect to Gemma, because she did seem like such a sweet person, but they really had not much in common at all. Gemma was 27, Chantelle was 21. Chantelle really liked drinking and going out and being quite rowdy and wild. And Gemma wasn't like that. She much preferred a night in. They just had nothing in common. They were from completely different backgrounds. And of course there was Gemma's disabilities, her undiagnosed, unconfirmed disabilities that we don't know what she had, but her family acknowledged that this made her quite hard to communicate with. She wasn't very good at wording what was in her mind. It was quite frustrating to try to have a conversation with Gemma unless you were her friend for a long time or a family member that really understood how she communicated. It could be quite frustrating to try and have a conversation with her. And so her family, as soon as she made friends with Chantel, they were like, wow, this girl must be so sweet, so patient, so kind, 
to give Gemma a chance like this. It sounds awful, it really does, but her family said that a lot of people in Gemma's life just couldn't get over that barrier of giving her that bit of extra patience to be able to communicate. But Chantelle was, and so they thought this girl must be so nice and kind. Her family were quite shocked because people like Chantelle and groups like that don't tend to make friends with people like Gemma unless it's for some sort of personal gain. That is what her own family have said. But as this friendship was going on, this immediate initial reaction that this girl was so sweet started to diminish as they began seeing her true motives with the friendship with Gemma. So because Gemma had this like disability allowance, she would get some money every week from the government just to help her live because she wasn't employed and she would go down to the corner shop every week and get it out there. And every week when she would do this, one member of this group would go with her. They wouldn't let her get it out by herself. And usually it was Chantelle that would go with her. They would go and they would get this cash out and then immediately from there, Chantelle would make Gemma spend it on things that Chantelle wanted her to. Stuff like alcohol, they would go to a bar and Gemma would be getting the rounds all night because she just got paid her disability allowance. So that meant that everyone got to spend it. They would make her buy the food, they would make her buy transport. You know, Gemma was the one funding this group on her disability allowance. And Gemma thought she wanted to but of course she was just being manipulated into doing that because Gemma was just so kind and generous and sweet and she hadn't had many friends in her life and now she finally had these friends, she wanted to do everything she could to keep them. And if that meant buying them things so that they would hang out with her more, then so be it. Gemma's family also noticed that when they went into her apartment after she was murdered, because of course when someone dies, their family have to go in and clear out their house so that the house can go back on the market. And so they went in there and they were boxing everything up and they realized that a lot of Gemma's belongings were actually missing. CDs, DVDs, uh, stereo, th different things like that were all gone. And her family had a hunch that maybe this new friend group had stolen them from Gemma. Or maybe even if they didn't steal them, maybe they manipulated Gemma into just handing them over. Because like I say, she was so nice and kind and she just wanted to keep friends with these people that if they asked her for something, if they liked the look of a particular CD and they asked Gemma if they could have it, she would give them it. There were also rumors going around Gemma's apartment building and around that general area at the time that Gemma's apartment was being used as a drug den. And these were hard drugs as well, like crack cocaine, heroin, and it's believed that all of these drugs actually belong to Chantelle Booth and the rest of the group. And this is actually called cuckooing. There's a, there's a word for this. And that is where drug dealers or people that are storing drugs, you know, users, they will manipulate a vulnerable person like Gemma into storing all those drugs on their premises so that if for any reason they get caught or raided, then Gemma is the one with all the drugs, not the dealers, not the group. So then it would be Gemma that got in trouble for it and not the group. It's always the vulnerable person that takes the blame. And this is a relatively common thing in the UK now. A lot of disabled people or elderly people, you know, young people's older family members, they will hide the drugs in their grandma's house or something like that so that they wouldn't get into trouble and their grandma would. It's the most awful thing. And these vulnerable people don't fully understand what is going on. Of course, Gemma thought she was just doing her friends a favor. Sometimes they're not even aware that these people are doing this, that these people are keeping the drugs at their house. Sometimes they'll just go in and hide them in someone else's house. And so now Gemma's family members were finding out about this after her death and they were thinking, well, if the group had done that to her, if they were hiding drugs in her house, then what else could they have done to her? And these rumors had been going around for a little while, even before Gemma even passed. And at one point, a family friend called Fran actually pulled Gemma aside and asked her about these rumors. And Gemma pretty much confirmed that the rumors were true, but she said, no, they're not drugs, they're presents for my friends and I'm just 
keeping hold of them. And she genuinely believed that. So what Chantel and the rest of the group had told Gemma was that these things that she had to hide in her house were surprise presents for their friends and they just didn't want their friends to see them or know that they had them. So they were asking Gemma to keep them at their house until their friend's birthdays. I don't fully know if Gemma knew that they were drugs or just thought that they were just gifts. I don't actually know. And I don't think anyone knows, but... I think it's pretty obvious that Gemma wasn't told the full story by her friends and so maybe she didn't fully realise what she was hiding. So Fran asked Gemma why she'd got involved with this, like why she had got involved with this group when this is not her scene, it had never been her scene, she'd never been a criminal, she'd never been into any of this and Gemma turned around to her and just said, because they're my friends because they like me. And Fran could tell that Gemma was literally just doing anything to keep this group around her because she was finally happy that she had a social circle. She had people to hang out with, people to go to the pub with. And if they were gonna ask her to keep drugs in her house, then of course she was gonna do it in order to keep these friends. Now this whole friendship group all had either a criminal history or at least a troubled history in some kind of aspect. Maybe they were always getting into trouble at school or whatever. For example, Chantel Booth and Jessica Linus, they were always in trouble at school. They actually went to the same school as Gemma's niece. If you remember in the beginning of the video, I said she had a niece when she was about 11 years old, which, you know, with the age gap between Chantel and Gemma, I think Chantel was in one of her last years of school when Gemma's niece was just joining school. So she knew Chantel Booth, well, she knew of Chantel Booth and Jessica Linus. And she said that they were always badly behaved, always getting told off by teachers, always in detentions or isolations. They were, they were the girls that talked back in school. Joe Boyer, the youngest boy in the group, Jessica Linus's boyfriend, was actually in Gemma's niece's friend group in school. That's getting a little bit confusing now, but Gemma's niece knew Joe Boyer quite well. She remembered this one time where she was sharing chocolate buttons with him out in the schoolyard. Like, she knew him. And she recalled him being just quite a nice guy, quite a funny guy. He was just normal. He didn't really get into as much trouble in school. He was quite a cheeky kind of guy, but he wasn't bad. But his trouble actually came more outside of school. His trouble was more actual, like, crime. He'd got done for stealing. At one point, I don't know what the backstory behind this was, but at one point him and all of his friends were actually surrounded by 40 armed police for something. I think they might have stolen something from a shop or stolen quite a few things from a shop. I don't actually know. But he was getting into trouble for things like that quite regularly outside of school. Daniel Newstead, Chantel Booth's boyfriend, he was actually like violent. He would get into trouble for violent crimes quite a lot. He'd assaulted his own mother, his sister, beaten them both up and of course got done by police for that. Literally since the age of 15, Daniel Newstead had so many different charges from drugs, weapons, theft, violence charges, I say like a lot, lot of violence charges, fighting, stuff like that. Chantel herself had actually been charged with GBH, grievous bodily harm, which is a assault. She'd also been done for harassment along with Jessica Linus. They got done at the same time because they were harassing I don't know, this one particular person together. I actually think this person that they were harassing was another vulnerable person. I don't know in what way they were vulnerable, but I did read that they were another vulnerable person, which to me is kind of proof that they targeted Gemma for the pure fact that she was vulnerable and they felt that they could overpower her and dominate her and do what they want. Just a side note here as well, it's kind of not that related, but I don't know where else to put this in. But um, Jessica Linus, the 18 year old, actually had a child at one point, but because of her criminal history and her inability to look after this child, she actually had it taken off her and this child was put into the care system. I actually read a couple of sources that said the same thing about Chantel, that she had also had a baby when she was very young, but because they were both so involved in crime again and again and again, and because they didn't look after their children properly, I don't know if they neglected them or abused them or just left them and didn't have the money to pay for different things, food and clothes for them, they both had their children taken off of them. So at the time of this case, they had children, but they weren't, you know, looking after them. Anyway, back to what I was saying about all of their criminal charges. So there was 19 year old Duncan Edwards, who was the final member of the group. 
and he actually had over 20 different arrests and charges and he's 19 years old 20 is a lot like how do you get up to 20 different crimes by the age of 19 he must have been like one after another after another again they were all kind of similar things like fights assault drugs theft all those different things. So these were the kind of people that the very vulnerable Gemma Hater was surrounded by in her everyday life and gradually it really was starting to affect her. For example, Gemma's family friend Fran that we spoke about earlier, she actually saw Gemma on the day before she was murdered on August 7th. Gemma was standing outside of this shop and Chantelle and her boyfriend Daniel were just a few meters down the road waiting at a bus stop. So Gemma was actually kind of by herself and Fran saw her and called her over. Fran said hi, she asked Gemma what she was up to, where she was going, and Gemma told her that she was going to Coventry with all of her friends. And Fran said, oh, why are you going there? You never go to Coventry. And Gemma replied, well, they tell me what they want and I go get it for them. So Fran kind of knew what Gemma meant, but she, she just wanted to clarify what she'd just said. And so Fran said, what, you steal for them? And Gemma nodded confirming that this is what she meant. They would go out into these shops, the group would point things out that they wanted Gemma to steal and then she would put them in her bag or up her shirt and try and get them out of the shop, steal them. And so Fran turned to her and she said, why on earth would you do that? Do you realize how much trouble you could get into for doing things like that? And Gemma just gave the same reason. She said, yeah, but they're my friends and they like me. It was always that same reasoning. It was always that same thing that they had over Gemma. Gemma was desperate for friendship and they almost used it as blackmail for her. Like, if you don't do what we want, then we're not gonna be friends anymore. That same night that the group got back from Coventry, so this was the night before Gemma's murder, they all went out in rugby. They were all just gonna go to a bar or a pub and have some drinks. And police managed to get some CCTV footage of the group outside of the bar. They're all waiting outside, it looks very normal, but then all of a sudden, Chantel walks over to Gemma and just starts shoving her down the road, pushing her. And you can see the rest of the group standing at the bottom of the road, smiling, laughing, joking, that this girl is abusing one of their friends. This whole group just used Gemma Hater as a form of entertainment whenever they were out. She was just like their little jester that they would just abuse and push and tease and pick on just for their own entertainment. They would find this funny. It was later discovered that Chantal Booth's reason for doing this on this particular CCTV clip where she's pushing Gemma down the road, they found out that her reason was because Gemma had made a joke outside of the pub that hadn't fallen very well. So the legal drinking age over here in the UK is 18. You have to be 18 to be able to get into a bar and to be able to order alcoholic drinks, which all of the group, apart from Joe Boyer, were over 18, so I think he was probably gonna try and use a fake ID or something. But when it came to Chantelle handing her ID over to the bouncer, Gemma swooped in and made a joke. She said, oh, don't let Chantelle in, she's only 16. And so the bouncer just looked at the group and he was like, guys, I, I can't let you in now. If you've literally just told me that one of you is underage, I can't let any of you in here. Even though it was just a joke and the group tried to explain that to him, he was like, I'm sorry, I, d I don't care if it's a joke. You said that you were 16, you can't come in here. And I think he also got in contact with every other pub or bar in the area and said, look, this group of people that could be underage are trying to get into a bar. Don't let them in any of the bars. And so this joke from Gemma kind of ruined the night. It meant that they couldn't get in anywhere, they couldn't go for drinks, and it also probably ruined their chances of ever going for drinks in rugby again, because now they would be blacklisted from all these pubs, and so Chantelle was fuming. And that is her reaction that we see on that CCTV, her pushing Gemma down the street, assaulting her, the group all laughing, that was their reaction to not being let into that pub. It's also believed that there was another point that same night where Jessica Linus actually slapped Gemma Hater around the face, although there's no proof of that and it was only mentioned on a couple of sources, so I don't know how accurate that is. And again, I don't know what the reason behind that was, whether it was for the same reason as 
the abuse that Chantel gave her or if something else happened at some other point during that night and Jessica slapped her. But anyway, they ended the night and Gemma went back to her own house and then the next morning, so this was the morning of her murder, she actually called up Chantel and she said, oh, I think I left my bag at yours last night. Can I come around and pick it up? And Chantel said, yeah, sure. You can come around anytime today. I'm literally just at home all day. Me and Jessica are actually gonna order some food. And this spooked Gemma a little bit, hearing that Jessica was there. Because it's believed that Jessica slapped her the night before. So obviously Gemma didn't really wanna turn up at Chantel's apartment and see Jessica the girl that had assaulted her. But Chantelle talked Gemma into coming round anyway. She was like, look, it's fine. Like everything will be fine. You'll make friends, just come round. And so Gemma set off walking from her house. She did the two mile walk all the way to Chantelle's alone. And that was when everything seemed to go bad. As soon as Gemma arrived at Chantelle's home, because the next morning, Gemma Hater was found murdered. Police were able to confirm through texts and CCTV footage that Gemma was 100% at Chantelle's home that night. There's CCTV footage of her entering the building alone. There were texts between them both where Chantelle's saying, come on, just come round, and Gemma's saying, okay. So police were certain at this point that this friendship group had something to do with Gemma's murder. And so at this point, they decided to call every single one of them in for questioning. Police very quickly noted with every single one of this friendship group that when they sat down for their interviews, none of them seemed to care. None of them showed any level of remorse or sadness or grief or empathy or anything. They acted like this was the biggest inconvenience ever. They were moody that they had to go for a question in at the police station. Which, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think if if your friend was murdered, you wouldn't be acting like this was a big inconvenience to your life. You would be wanting to help the investigation. You would wanna find out who had done this to your best friend and get your best friend some level of justice. And the same energy kind of carried on through their questionings. They really weren't giving much detail. They were deflecting a lot of the questions. They were giving half stories rather than a full context story. But anyway, as they had this whole group in the police station, police decided to take advantage of this and they went and searched Chantal Booth's apartment. Since that was the last place that Gemma was known to be alive in. So they went over there and they conducted a full search and they found some mental evidence. All the way up one of the walls in the living room, there was a huge spray of blood all over the radiator, all up the wall. So police took a sample of this blood, they took it back to the lab for testing and they found that this was a match to 27 year old Gemma Hater's blood. So they could confirm that Gemma was at least assaulted in that house. They do have the CCTV footage of her walking out of the building with the the rest of the group just after midnight so that shows that she wasn't killed in the apartment but the assault definitely started there and that blood proved it so police decided to confront all of the group in their interviews with this evidence and say look we literally have her blood in Chantel's apartment so start telling us the truth and it was at that point that this story finally started unraveling and police learned the truth of what happened to Gemma Hater that night. Gemma was subjected to an awful, prolonged torture in Chantelle Booth's apartment that night. The group punched her, kicked her, slapped her, beat her with a mop, stomped on her face. Police concluded that that blood spatter all up the wall was from when one member of the group had grabbed Gemma by the hair and bounced her head off of the radiator. Some of these reports even say that Gemma was tied to the radiator at one point too because her hands were tied together using tape, her mouth was taped over so that she couldn't speak or scream and they believe that her hands were tied together and then taped to the radiator. So she was just kept almost chained up like a dog. Like I said, they taped over her mouth and her hands and then they locked her in a toilet in the dark alone, literally in this tiny little cupboard. She was just bleeding and hurt and confused and scared in this toilet all alone. But before they did that, actually, before they locked her in there, they took her phone apart, her mobile phone, and flushed the phone battery down the toilet so that she wouldn't be able to call anyone for help. She wouldn't be able to call her mother or her sister to come and get her. Joe Boyer and Duncan Edwards actually took an empty can of beer and urinated in it 
and then passed it to Gemma Hater and forced her to drink it. She was forced to drink her attacker's urine. Once they'd spent a good few hours torturing poor Gemma Hater in this apartment, they told her that they would be willing to walk her home. And so Gemma must have felt such a big sense of relief at this point that she was finally gonna get to go home. She wouldn't have to put up with this any longer. She believed that they were gonna take her home. But of course we know that that never happened. The group knew that they were just changing locations. The torture hadn't finished. The assault hadn't finished. In fact, it was only just beginning. They were just moving somewhere else to carry it on. So in the middle of this huge torture session, the group led Gemma Hater down all these different streets. She's seen on all these different CCTV cameras, literally staggering. She's far behind the group because she's in pain. She can't keep up with them. There's some clips where you even see the blood in her nose or you see her lifting a tissue up to her nose. Gemma had no idea at this point as she was walking through these streets that she was still only midway through her ordeal. They walked her down onto that disused railway path where her body was later found the next morning because this disused railway path was actually a shortcut to Gemma's house. Well, it would have been a shortcut to Gemma's house if they'd have gone on there and turned left, but the group went on there and turned right. And I wonder what Gemma was thinking in that moment. Did she realise that they'd turned the wrong way? And if she did realise that they were heading the wrong way, do you think she started thinking about what was going to happen to her? Do you think she knew that she would be killed. Anyway, they walked down this railway path to the right and then they stopped in the middle of the path and that is where the torture continued. They stripped her completely naked, made her take off all her clothes and then they put a bin liner over her head and tied it. There they continued beating her, they were stomping on her face. One of them even produced a knife and stabbed her at the top of her back, just underneath her neck. They punched her, kicked her a few more times, and then they stepped back and saw what they'd done to this woman. She was laying naked, face down in the dirt, suffocating on her own blood, and this group fled the scene. They carried her clothes further down the path and tried to set them on fire. It didn't really work. They were trying to get rid of evidence. And then after that, they all walked back to Chantelle's house as if nothing had ever happened. They're seen on CCTV. Chantelle and her boyfriend Daniel are literally holding hands, swinging their arms like they're on a date. They just murdered someone together and now they're walking hand in hand back to her apartment. There's people just texting on their phones. They really do not care what they'd just done to this woman. It hasn't affected them at all. They're walking as if nothing's happened. The next morning, the group woke up and Jessica Linus actually tried to cover her tracks by posting a Facebook status as if she had no idea what was going on. This status read, wants to know what happened on Hilly Road. Is it true they found a body? And then she also used the rest of the status to express her love for her boyfriend, Joe Boyer, and her son that was taken away from her, which I think is quite a peculiar um, mashup of things to write a sentence on. You're talking about a dead body that's been found in town and then you're saying, love my boyfriend by the way, but that's beside the point. People started commenting on Jessica's status saying that it was Gemma Hater's body that was found. She was found with marks around her neck. She was naked, like giving her all the details. And Jessica is pretending she's never heard any of this before. She's going, oh my God, that's awful. RIP Gemma. And she knows that she is the one that did that to her her and all of her friends, she watched it all. She watched that woman die. And now she was pretending on social media like she had no idea who she was. Of course, in the end, this little Facebook cover up hadn't worked. And Jessica Linus, along with her other four friends, were all charged with Gemma Hater's murder. The five of them were put on trial on June 8th, 2011, and this trial lasted eight weeks in total. And Gemma's sister said that on the first day of the trial, it was, probably the worst day of her whole life because she had to stand there in the dock and listen to them reading out every single injury that Gemma had sustained that night. Everything that this group had done to her from the apartment to the walk to the railway station 
to torturing her and then leaving her there to die. And it's been reported that as all of this was being read out in court, those five defendants, all of the murderers, were standing in the dock laughing and joking and trying to communicate with each other. In the end, all five of them pled not guilty to murder which I don't know how they ever thought they were gonna get away with that. There was literally so much evidence from CCTV to literal blood evidence. There were texts, there was so much to say that they had murdered Gemma. And because this crime was actually classed as a hate crime, because Gemma was specifically targeted because she was vulnerable, because she had some level of disability, that is the reason why they adopted her into their friend group and took advantage of her and then murdered her. They wouldn't have done this if she wasn't disabled. And so for that reason, the sentences that these five people were about to be handed were a lot larger than they could have been. Jessica Linus and Duncan Edwards were both 19 now at the time of the trial and they were both found guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. Jessica was given 13 years in prison and Duncan was given 15 years. I don't know for what reason these two managed to get away with manslaughter. Of course, we don't know the exact details of what each person did to Gemma. So maybe these two people, Jessica and Duncan, didn't do as much to her as the other people did. All we really know for sure is that Duncan urinated in that beer can and made Gemma drink it, which is torture, it is assault, but it didn't necessarily lead to the murder. So I don't know what these two actually did, but I trust that the courts actually gave them a suitable sentence for their part in this whole thing. I mean, it is kind of disappointing because they did both stand there and watch this woman die. They had so many opportunities to stop it. They had so many opportunities to say something to their friends. Even if Jessica and Duncan hadn't done anything directly to Gemma, they could have stopped it. And so actually for that reason, I think their sentences are quite low. They stood by and encouraged it. So, but the other three members of the group, there was Chantal Booth, who was now 22 years old, Daniel Newstead, her boyfriend, who was now 20, and Joe Boyer, who was now 18 years old, they were all found guilty of murder. They were all given life in prison. Chantel had a minimum of 21 years, Daniel had a minimum of 20, and Joe had a minimum of 16. And Joe Boyer, the youngest one of the whole group, actually wrote a letter to one of his friends from home as he was awaiting in his holding cell for his trial. And in this letter, he actually says to his friends that he can't wait to be in a proper prison for lifers, which are people serving a life sentence, because he expected it to be really easy living. This is a quote from the letter. It sounds sick, bro. Key to my door, bear shit to do, PlayStation and DVDs, proper bed, proper chair and table, lol. Imagine that, looking forward to getting a PS2, lol. He goes on to say, I get to go into town in normal clothes. I get to go to McDonald's and cinema and Nando's or whatever I want and get home visits. I don't know why he thought he was going on like a school trip. This is life in prison. You don't get a PS2 just in your room. You only get that kind of stuff with good behavior. And even then it's not guaranteed. And just being able to go to the cinema and Nando's just in normal clothes, I don't think so. Prison officials were questioned about this letter by the media, because of course, as soon as the media found out about this letter, it was everywhere. It was all over the news. Like, look, this guy that committed murder thinks he's gonna be going to Nando's. And prison officials made a statement to the media that Joe Boyer would be sorely disappointed because it wasn't gonna be anything like he was expecting. They actually said that anyone on a life sentence can get into open conditions with the approval of the parole board. So open conditions being like, you're allowed to go out and you're allowed to have a PS2 and go to Nando's maybe. They went on to say, there is no just popping out to Nando's. Prison privileges must be earned and remorse for the crime plays a big part. This young man has not shown a shred of remorse. Anyway, after this trial, a big investigation was done into Gemma Hater's care her whole life because she'd been shrugged off by so many agencies and doctors and officials and professionals, people trying to assess her, that maybe if she had received the proper care that she needed all her life, then maybe she wouldn't have been murdered. And it was found in this review that there had been plenty of opportunities to help Gemma 
throughout her life that were just missed completely. Maybe if she'd had carers in her life that she could talk to and share things with, then maybe she would have told them about this new friend group that she made. Maybe this carer would have noticed the red flags in this friendship and then something could have been done before it got to this point where she was killed. If she was made aware that this friend group were manipulating her, then, you know, this wouldn't have happened. Or maybe if she'd have been allowed access to certain care programs or centers or groups, then maybe she would have been able to make better friends. In total, there were found to be 23 missed opportunities to help Gemma Hater throughout her whole life. And nine of these all took place within the last year of her life. There were nine opportunities to help and save Gemma Hater in the year before she was murdered. But every single one of those was just shrugged off. Warwickshire councillor Les Cabon said, we are sorry, the whole authority is sorry about what happened. Could we have prevented it? I don't think so. But what we are far more certain of now is that the arrangements we have in place will stop such a thing happening again. That quote actually personally makes me a little bit angry. Could we have prevented it? No. What do you mean? Yes, you could. You just could. Maybe not strictly because how could they have known that this friend group was gonna turn around and murder Gemma one day? But if she had care, then they would have picked up the early warning signs and yes, it absolutely could have been prevented. Some agencies actually responded to this whole review because obviously it came out that no one was doing their jobs properly and they had the nerve to say that it was actually Gemma that was refusing their help, not them refusing to help Gemma. They said that they had offered it to her but she didn't want it which we know is not true. Let me just remind you, she literally wrote a letter to the authorities as soon as she moved out into her new flat, literally begging for assisted living because she felt like she couldn't live by herself. She wanted help getting a job. She wanted someone to help take care of her, her personal care and stuff like that. She was asking for help and no one was giving her it. It wasn't the other way around at all. Gemma's mother, Sue, has literally spent almost every penny she has trying to fight for some answers and for some justice and for some compensation for what happened to her daughter through her life. Literally all the money that she got from her mother, so from Gemma's grandmother when she died, she put all of that money into getting some justice for her daughter Gemma. She spent it all on solicitors and legal fees and lawyers because she firmly believes that if Gemma had the proper care, she would still be here today. She wouldn't have been murdered. And her mother has also said that just because of the kind of woman that Gemma was, I've said it so many times, she was so generous and kind and sweet and naive and easily manipulated. She said that if Gemma had somehow survived that ordeal, survived the attack and the torture and was still alive today, she would have forgiven her friend group that did all of that to her, that literally tried to kill her, she would have forgiven them. Gemma's family have been so, so passionate about spreading awareness of Gemma's story because there's so many people everywhere, all over the world that could be in Gemma's situation right now, showing those early warning signs, being in a bad manipulative friend group that are taking advantage of them and their vulnerability. There's so many people that could be there right now. And if they hear Gemma's story, then maybe they will identify the red flags in their own life and they could save their own life one day. I'm just gonna put a clip in here of Gemma's older sister, Nikki, because she posted this video after a documentary went live on Gemma's case and it really, really stuck with me. Normally in a situation like this, I probably wouldn't put the video in. I'd probably just paraphrase it and describe it to you guys. But the way that she worded it and the emotion in her voice, I, I don't want to take away from that. So I'm just going to play that now. One of the running themes from everybody that's messaged me is that they are astounded and disgusted that um, these five people um, that committed this murder exist. Um, and that's kind of made me think, do you know what? They, they weren't being down from um, an evil planet. Um, they are part of our society. They are our children. They are our children's friends. They are the future. It's it's quite saddened me actually. Um, the more I've thought about it, um, watching the CCTV footage and seeing the amount of people in my hometown that um, walked past incidences that were, were going on that night. Um, I'm not saying that they could have changed the outcome. Um, but I'd just like to give you an example. Um, I was walking through town a couple of months ago um, 
there was about 12, 15 kids, um, well, 15, 16 years old, picking on a homeless guy who I happen to know his special needs. Now, I could have walked past, I, you know, I could have done, I could have just put my head down and gone and met my friends, but I didn't. I took them to one side. I said, look, you know, I'm sorry, but I've got to stop you. What the fuck do you think that you were just doing? Sorry for my language. And they went, oh, oh it, it wasn't me, it was our mate. And I could have said, oh, okay then. But instead, I was like, do you really think that your mate would have been stood there having a go at that homeless guy who is special needs if you lot weren't stood around him laughing? I said, you're part of that. You've just helped make that happen. And you could see him thinking about it. And I went on to sort of say to him, you know, what are you doing with your lives? You know, who's to say that's not going to be one of you? Because look what you're doing with your life tonight. You're doing nothing. You're hanging around in freezing cold weather in the middle of town when you've got homes to go to. That guy hasn't got a home to go to. Do you, do you feel good about yourselves? And they were like, no, no. And they were very apologetic. Now, I hope, I really hope that next time one of them think they're in a situation like that, they stop. This is what I said to them. It would have just taken one of you to say to that little prick, you bang out of order, mate. Come on, leave him alone. And I really hope that my actions will make them think next time. And something else I'd really like you to know, something that has stuck with me and hurts me whenever I remember it. I've had the privilege of being invited into people's homes and into special needs schools to speak to um, lovely, lovely people. One of the things that has always come up with all of them, people with special needs believe that um, it's normal for them to be bullied, that it's part and parcel of being special needs. So they don't bother reporting it. That is sickening. That is absolutely sickening that these people struggle with their, their disabilities every day, get picked on for it, get pushed, kicked, robbed, laughed at, and they don't bother telling anybody because it's just part of being special needs. Those people that are doing that to them are our kids. They're your neighbours. They're your nieces, your nephews, maybe even your mum and dad. You know, don't call your kid a retard if he's, if he's being silly about something or playing up you know you're insinuating that these people are something to be used as an insult it's very close to my heart and i want you to look at yourselves and ask what you do in situations and how you want your kids to grow up and how you would like your kids god forbid if they were born with any disability at all how would you like society to treat them and let's start changing the way this is going because it's not going to change like i said these people aren't beamed in from another planet they're born here we raise them as a community, as a society. But that is all I have for this video. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the way that I told this case, please leave a thumbs up down below on this video because that would really, really help me out. Thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you want to download the game, you can do so through the link down below in the description or you can scan the QR code on screen right now. If you do, you'll get an epic hero named Chonaru, 200k silver, one XP boost, one energy refill, and one ancient shard so that you can summon a new champion as soon as you get in the game. Huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you wanna to subscribe to my channel, you can do through the link right here. If you wanna to subscribe to my second channel, there's some fun stuff coming on there very soon you can do so through this link and if you want to watch another true crime video there'll be a playlist on the screen right now bye